We are the immigrants into this country from 1962. The link between India and England. We are the last of what we'd term as the true Anglo-Indian. Anglo-Indian, as people will see it in future, won't be what we experience. We experience the whole Indian culture and now the British culture. culture. We are the dying race, if you like. No children to be playing in the car park, so if you see any kids, send them in. Are you listening? Yeah. Children, if you're caught in the car park, you'd have to come up here and sing a song. <laughs> and if you're really not, you'd have to eat the goat curry. <laughs> yeah. And those who've never tried goat curry, there's your opportunity. I'm sure you'd like it. But if you get an upset stomach, don't come bleating to me. <laughs> well, as you can see, I've inherited the Anglo-Indian genes, my beautiful aunties and uncles, <laughs> trying to um, get people to understand what an Anglo-Indian is. In Indian, with the British upbringing, that's how I'd explain it. The nice it. thing about it, it's a mix between the Indian culture and the West. Oh, it's a dying race, because it is, it is a dying race, because the young ones that are born here are British, they have no, they have no identity with it. Anglo-Indian is family, family orientated, fun. Big get-togethers, celebrations, guitars, curry, biryani. Get food and give music. We're brown. Anglo-Indian. You get good food and, <laughs> and, 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 a, wicked, and a wicked family. <laughs> Families are like tricked in the park, but we still try to keep it together. Doesn't matter how old you are, being Anglo Indian, you're still like a kid. Anglo Indian women are never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think that goes in most races, though, doesn't it? Cousins, how many cousins? We've got I'm, more kids than the world. I've lost count. We stop <laughs> saying goodnight because we never get to sleep, we start to get up. Oh my gosh, there's so many of us. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've got nephews and nieces, but I can't work. This is one. <laughs> and the other nephews are working. Approaching the 30s, 40s, aren't yeah. we? When you talk, when you're talking about second cousins as well, there's loads of us. It's really grown. The family's huge. I did a family tree when I was about 12, and there was about 96 there. Probably just over 100. Yeah, I could. I'm here forever. All right, I'll start from the top. Auntie Mary. Auntie Anne. Auntie Dot. Auntie Liz, Uncle Alfie, Uncle Charlie. So then the next generation is Jeanette, Keith, Lynette, Debbie, me, Liz, Richard, Lavina, Brian, Peter, Mark, Paul, James, Angela, Kelly, Christopher, Kerry, Dominic, Lauren, Marie, Shireen, Leela. Have I missed anybody? Oh, Thomas, Matthew, Lina. Jay, Christopher and Daniel, Oliver Jason. and Jacob, Jasmine, Gabriella, Nathan, Lily. Amy, Billy. Billy. Billy, Karis and Aaron, and mine are Roger, Adriana, oh. Renee. Family. Cultural heritage, really. Yeah. So we have an influence of so many different nationalities, diversity, yeah. diversity, and different cultures. That says it all, I think. <laughs> Vasco da Gama, what I learned in school was a Portuguese um, sailor who came around the Cape of Good Hope and into India that way, through Africa and into India. He brought the Portuguese influence and the spice trade started about that time.
that's where it all began, I suppose. You know, I found it very interesting as a little girl learning about this wonderful sailor coming across these seas from unknown places, never thinking that one day I will sail those same seas to, to, to come to a land called England. to India, I, can't, I don't know when, and basically all the Englishmen, uh, they, they, uh, they took all the Indian women and made kids with them, and uh, <laughs> didn't they? I swear that's what they did. No, they never did that. Okay, they didn't. Families immigrated into India from the days of Robert Clive. A lot of Irish people yes. immigrated, mm. French ancestry, English, That's and it. Portuguese had, as well. Yeah. Anywhere from basically between uh, Britain and the continent. Anyone born of European and Indian blood were Eurasians. The initial term used for these mixed uh, race children were Eurasians. And it was later that they were referred to as Anglo Indian. But the Anglo came from the English Anglo-Saxon. Anglo yes. yes, I know, so, but yeah. what I'm saying is we all got the term Anglo-Indian. From if one, we, yeah. Even if it was, wasn't yes. English, it just... Yeah. It may not term. be politically correct, but that's yeah. what we understood yeah. Anglo-Indians yeah. to, to be. be. So many different mm -hmm. ways that the Anglo-Indian came about. The biggest increase of the Anglo-Indian population was when the East India Company was formed. Those staff of the East India Company were paid an allowance to father children with all the Indian women to increase the population of their workforce. It just increased from that, you know, and then there were too many and they got worried. <laughs> mm. And then Anglo-Indians, once that uh, liaison was formed, then looked to marry other Anglo-Indians and that's how it's continued. Not many people that I come across that are know what Anglo-Indian is when I explained who my mum was and how she was born in India but she doesn't speak an Indian language, she's always spoken English, she's the religious always, part as well. yeah, she's Catholic. always um, eaten um, westernised food as well as the Indian food, as Shuri was saying, Catholic background, so they don't understand us not being a Hindu or um, a Sikh. Let's put it in. How's it work? Should we try something else? That definitely would be flurry. My dad's side, French, Indian. I mean, we're getting more and more. French in us? Yeah, French flurry. Where do you think flurries came from? I don't know. <laughs> France. My father was the descendant of a French soldier. Right, okay. As far as we know, Dad's family originated in a place called Pondicherry, just below Madras. It was a native East Indian woman from the Pondicherry area that married a French soldier. Her Christian name was Mary Agnes, but we'll never know what her actual native name was. The difficult part is we can't trace our Indian ancestry, being that most of the Indian blood has come from women. You had to convert to the Catholic faith to get married in a church, and it was only a church wedding that was accepted as a marriage. It's quite sad when you think back to it. It's very hard to trace back the woman's side. In my family tree, I've got no woman's name in there. I don't know how far back we were mixed. You can only trace it back to a native Indian woman with a Christian name. Yes, yes, yes. You you're right, you're right, you're right. Like my cousin, he's Anglo-Indian and he married an Indian woman. And 
her name is Grace now. They give her name Grace. Yeah. I know she's an Indian, she's a Bengali girl. And they don't have in English names. But uh, somehow there's her husband gave her a name. Uh, she, she, when she became a Christian, she gave herself a Christian name. Our great descendant settled in Pondicherry, but that was from my father's side. From my mother's side, it was Eton and Hayes, and that was Ireland and England. That's um, Alfred Bernard Hayes. My grandfather was a superintendent of police. My grandfather had several properties in India, you know, so that's how it was. I mean, I was all too young to know the pros and cons of it all, but he ha he owned several properties and he was quite well off in Anglo-Indian terms. I just remember the house, my grandfather's lovely bungalow-style house. Yeah. Inside the garden, we're still filming the house. And now we get to take a little walk. I remember it being very pretty with the fountain in the middle and the proton freeze around. That's her excuse and she's a sticking to it. <laughs> the family was very large. I was told somewhere in the region of between 17 and 19 children. A very busy man. <laughs> That's my mother seated there and uh, her brothers and sisters. Say their nicknames as well. Uh, oh, Birdie. Tiny at the back there, Sissy, Sunny Hayes, Willie Hayes, Ada, Tarzan. Mum's nickname was Billy. Always known through her life as Billy because she was such a tomboy. <laughs> Mother would make her Christmas cakes, which were like cake. rock hard. She <laughs> had the faintest idea how to cook. But nevertheless, she tried she and nice we often wine. think back to those days and she wouldn't make one. In those days, they would make 20 plus cakes, you know, and uh, of course, these 20 plus cakes, you could have built uh, the pyramids because it was so damn hard. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we enjoyed it because it was a treat. <laughs> Dad was known as John Alexander Fleury, and Mum was Eileen Hayes, and he literally married the girl next door because uh, the Fleury's rented off the Hayes family and after field service during the war he came back and fell in love and married mum. <laughs> Sweet. On Literally. the 27th of December, December. 1945. That's it. I think our basic culture was British. The Anglo Indians adopted what they thought to be the British way of life as opposed to the Indians. So they dressed like the British in British clothes, they spoke English, and whatever Indian language became the second language because mm. English then became their first language. The Anglo Indians and uh, our adaptation of the British way of life, you know. We adapted more to the British way than the Indian way. We never spoke in the Indian language, like we always spoke English. Our mother tongue is English. But that, that's what makes it the best of both worlds, though, yes. doesn't it? It gives you the best of both worlds. Yes. You can take both sides. The Anglo Indians always had the upper status on the Indians at that time, oh, yeah. didn't they? They did live a privileged life during the British rule in India. Most Anglo-Indians had some sort of a domestic help. Ayah is a term for the cook, who would do the shopping from the markets and prepare the meals for the day. Some of them lived in quarters at the back, some of them had little homes to go home to. We had one called Mary Ayah, who was with my dad's family for many, many years. She knew my dad as a young man and she, she, she was she joined the family when my dad was maybe in his 20s and 30s and, you know, she'd been there for many years. So when we left India, I remember her crying bitterly that, you know, we were going away and things like that. But my aunt did make sure she looked after her. 
they had very good jobs. The administration jobs, even the secretaries and uh, stenographers, as they used to call them, that was the old fashioned word. Oh, probably Anglo Indian. They ran the railways, the post and telegraphs, and, and many other civil. And they were very proud uh, of it too, yeah. you know. It was a, quite a different community, really, the Anglo Indian community, the railway community. Dad joined the army, he was out in the Middle East for five years. Then he joined the railways. Dad was a traveling ticket collector the Southern Indian Railways. So we were a poor <laughs> ticket collector's daughter. <laughs> India has many, many colonies, railway colonies. We could into a mining village where people lived and worked in the same area. It's all, all railway people worked in that colony, all worked on the railways. A little bit like the army, you would be posted to a certain station, like my father was. And being on the railway, they move from town to town, places like wherever the, the father takes, uh, the job is take, takes them to. This is the whole family. We are on our way to Erod. The lighting is a bit bad, but they've insisted I take this video. God only knows why. E road, that's a place right. called E Road Railway Colony, which is where my father was posted yeah. to. Yeah, just focused it. It's a small uh, railway town, which is in the Tamil Nadu area, and it's between a place called Jolrapet which is all on the, the same line, and a place called Coimbatore. In the colonies, most, 99% I would say, were Anglo-Indian families, and uh, they are just railway people. In the railway colony, they had a, a hall. They had social activities there. Yes, and they would have tennis and hockey teams, and things like that. There would be an institute in most colonies where there would be dances and Christmas time functions. A lot of the British would attend and the Anglo-Indian girls would attend. This was very much part of Western influence for the Anglo-Indians. It was a simple life. The more senior, like the guards, had proper bungalows surrounded by gardens and things. It depended on your ranking in the railway, whether you qualified or not for quarters. We didn't, so we had to rent privately. Seems strange to see it standing here after 30 years. We had a very small house that was rented. Then to the right, I don't know who lived there, Marcus, yes? Yeah, Marcus was the first house and then the Simmons. The Simmons. I can't remember who I hope I'm not walking to the gutter. I remember this, um, what looked like a huge stream in front of our house, but when we went back recently it was more like a gutter. And here's the dirty old gutter Mary is playing. Apparently the rains haven't come yet and when it comes it really flows. We got free rail travel. Yeah. So all our holidays were connected with the rail on the yes. steam trains. Dad took us down to Danish Cody. We stopped at one station and um, I was eating a banana and that was snatched out of my hand. It was uh, by a monkey. And that's my earliest memory. Most people's lives circled around the church. Our parents were Catholic, our grandparents were Catholic. That was our birthright. We're walking from the station to E Road. There's the Sacred Heart Church. And it makes a pleasant change from, to come back and find something that hasn't been changed. The children say they love my hometown. Best of all. Mum played the organ in E Road for, for the choir and on special occasions when um, work permitted it, 
dad would also join in in the choir on a very rare occasion and play the violin for like Christmas and Easter time. Here is Rotten Stairs by Mimi Masakhtan that many a time play the organ. They are still very fondly remembered here. Social and life was, was very much around yeah. the church. I think that applied to everybody really, you know, the, the Catholic Church. Yes. Your, life, your life was the Catholic Church. This church will feature in many photographs that they've got. As a family, we went to Mass every Sunday, kept up with all the Catholic traditions. This is holy water and you always bless yourself before you enter the church and bless yourself when you exit. We had evening prayers, we would say as a family. The family were gathered around by six o'clock. Us girls were never allowed to go out <laughs> after that time. School, the, all the, all the Anglican men went to the same school, all Catholic, so Christian. The railway people also had railway schools they can attend to. Most of us uh, and our uh, ancestors were educated in English schools, which still today stand in India. The entertainment those days was totally different. They lived very much, it was very much Home for your school. family, yes. Mum played the piano, Dad played the violin. And yeah. you'd have sing songs at home, mm. as a sort of entertainment, you know. And Dad came home. Violin with the violin out. And Mary, Annie, Lizzie, Dora, line up. <laughs> we had to line up. <laughs> Every time yeah. someone came to the house, we had to sing for them. We sat out on the warm summer evenings, and I mean really warm summer evenings, because Erode was a very, very hot place. Often the neighbours would come and join us and just participate in the fun and chat and we as children would love listening to all these stories. I'm sure half of them were made up but just to call, create a little bit of excitement in our lives, Dad would tell us ghost stories and we just absolutely loved listening to his ghost stories and uh, he was a good storyteller. He used to tell us about, uh, tell us a tale about a man who'd come off out of the mines. Yeah, he was coming home from work and he had to cross the railway line. And he saw this most beautiful woman. And he was just in a trance and he followed her. Uh, he saw this beautiful woman with this perfume of the jasmine. If you smell jasmine in the evening, there's the spirit. The Indians believe that, don't they? She crossed the line and he just went to follow her. And just as he was about to cross, the train came along and it sort of woke him up out of his trance. After the train went, he heard the ada da 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 o yo, ada da 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 o yo, which means, what a shame, what a shame. So she didn't get his life. He continued home. Uh, he again saw the woman. He followed her to a well. And she was trying to entrance him and lure him towards the well. She beckoned him to come. And he looked down and he saw her feet were turned completely around and that's the sign of a devil. He woke up and quickly rushed indoors and then he, as he was rushing indoors he heard a thud into the well so this, this she-devil had dropped into the well and that's the story, that's the ghost story for Cola Goldfield. <laughs> Now, whether this was true or not, I don't know. But, and you're uh, telling the, this to children, we've all grown up quite normal, let me tell you, <laughs> after all that. Yes. <laughs> frighten the living daylights out of us, but we love to hear we it time it. and time yeah. again. Something to frighten them away yeah. from, from evil and keep them in the Catholic Church. <laughs> oh, it certainly has. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Family meal, cooking and eating different foods is the centre point of Anglo Indian life and culture, yes. Cooking and dancing. That goes in general with all Anglo Indians. 
You go to somebody's house when they're having their lunch, they always say, join in, join in, because they cook not just for four people, they cook for a dozen. Food is always there on the table, the pot is boiling. What I'm going to do now is some papadums. India, as I say, is a nation of snacks, and they like all their little snacky bits that accompany the main meal, you know, salads and sambals and pickles. Every Anglo Indian is passionate about food that I have met anyway. Everyone likes to um, contribute and have their favorites and cook and talk about what they cook. If the oil is nice and hot, then these should come out quite dry and they harden almost straight away. Biryani mat, they like biryani. Curry bunches. They're just curry bunches, <laughs> <laughs> so you can say it. <laughs> Food brings people together. You know, it's a celebration, isn't it? And you can all sit down and break bread, as it were. And that's what brings people close together, having a good time. Food is, uh, is probably, once again, it's a mix between the West and Indian food. It has its own identity, and that's why you would never find that the type of cuisine you'll get in an Anglo-Indian home it would not be the same as you would get in an Indian restaurant, because it's their own interpretation of it. Although it had a British feel to it, it had spices in it. They probably didn't know exactly how to make typically English food or Indian food. They'd add some spice or pepper or something to it and sort of spike it up a bit. This lady will do the best carty rolls ever. I've just been to Germany and my brother-in-law could not get enough of this lady's carty rolls. They didn't cook in India. They learned to cook when they came over here. By memory, by watching the servants out there cooking. They didn't cook out there. So, but they're excellent cooks. They have tried very hard to be as good as my dad. Because my dad was the best cook. That's why dad married one of my sisters. Because he loved my dad's biryani. It was very much part and parcel of the Anglo-Indian scene, drinking and having a good time on the days off. Dad liked rum, triple X rum. Dad liked anything, I think, <laughs> but mostly rum. He used to call it grog. Yeah, he used to call it grog. <laughs> I think it is some sort yeah. of mushroom mm -hmm. made out of the Nungu. Tree. I think that's what it was. In the prohibited areas like Erode and Madras, alcohol was prohibited. So I don't know where my father got it from, but there were little shops that you can go and buy these things, which were very often put in a gripe water bottle, which is the baby's bottle. I suppose the only thing you really missed out on is that lifestyle, which you won't get here, that, that, that freedom. The enjoyment of growing up as a young boy, I think it was a man's, a boy's country, where they, all the outdoor life and flying kites and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Because in India we used to have kite fighting. We used to fly the kites quite high, very, very high, up in the air. And then they used to get into a tangle and we used to uh, put glass and make the thread very sharp to cut another boy's kite string. It's very nice, yes. Lots of Anglo-Indians did big game hunting. Both dad and mum's family used to go on big game shooting and that was quite a common thing with many, many Anglo-Indians there to go out on a hunt. I don't fully agree with hunting animals down because I, I've got my own very strong views about that. He used to take a shooting with him. We went out very, very early in the morning before dawn and he would shoot duck, wild duck, bring it home and have to cook it himself because mum would never deal with the thing. It was quite thrilling as children, you know. When you saw these eyes, what it was we don't know and all the excitement. It was 
quite the thing to do, which is sad on reflection. Mm. But a lot of people used to do it, go big game hunting. As a child, I used to see all these heads hanging up in the hall, mostly deer, I would say, but I have seen footage of tiger shoots and things like that, which is very sad. And I remember I was in Erode, and my teacher once did preservation of wildlife poem to us, and it went like this. Once on the plains of in they roam, so picturesque and free, today in jungle lands they hide from our modernity. Don't blame the long-range rifle, but the fellow in the car, the lazy one that will not stir, but sits in wounds from far. And I was so taken aback with this poem, and it always stayed in my mind. And uh, from that day, I well, it brought home to me what uh, people do to our wildlife. You know, just for the in the name of sport, and and I'm not. As I said, I've got very strong views about that. We have wonderful memories, you know, growing up with uh, our friends, playing freely. A lovely life. Charmed life. life. Yeah. Charmed life, in, not so, in so much as material things. It, it was just the freedom. Can you remember these little homes? Can you believe we lived in Bissau Happy and then? But there you are. Mary and this company is the back home. Innocence, the beauty, in a lot of ways. We obviously didn't realize the struggle our families were going through because no children ever do. My mum's family, I mean, you know, when she married my dad, my dad couldn't keep on the lifestyle perhaps she was born into. Here, Dad has entered uh, John's birth and death, and John Jr., John Anthony Fleury Jr. Johnny so, is our young brother who died when sadly. When and a half. He died in E-Road. Healthcare was very limited. It consisted of one doctor very far away from the colony. There were no telephones, there was no communication to get to a doctor. I always recall my dad, which I've never seen cry before, and he was uh, mm. very, yes, mm. he was sobbing his eyes out. Because it was the first son after four yes. girls, he was so happy. It was sad because he's such a lovely little boy. Fifteenth of August, nineteen forty-seven, India gained its independence. It was the turning point of the changing of India. Yes. They have been in India for over about two, three hundred years. So they have created quite a few generations of Anglo Indians. It was a day and an age where the country was splitting. The Anglo yes. Indian was no longer. Top held down. in any yeah. top down, yeah. exactly. We were dis disregarded. We were, we were like a lost crowd. They disowned us in a way, and people in India just didn't want to know Anglo Indians because when the British was there, they gave us the first choice of jobs, first choice of everything because we were their offspring. When the British left India, we were told to leave the country. Sorry, because we because. We, 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 we were neither English nor Indian, but we were Anglo Indian. Anglo Indians are, were never liked by the British or the Indians after independence. <laughs> yeah? we, we were the uh, unwanted race. Most of them, I have to say, have left India and spread all over the world. Now. There was a lot of people going away, and we just got sort of pulled into that channel of people leaving India. England in those days stood to offer us a better life, which it did, and which I'm very, very grateful for. And actually we were supposed to go to Australia. Yeah. We should and have emigrated to Australia. It's yeah. just because my aunt came here, Dad's sister. And they're very close when they don't. New, New, New Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. That side of the world, hey. Yeah, the damn <laughs> Get it <his> right. <laughs> I thought it was all spoiling. No, 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 no,
Anyway, because my dad and my aunt Doris were brother and sister. They were very close. He followed her here, so that's how we ended up here. My father had already flown into England to make a home for us and sort things out here for our arrival. We departed India on the ship Strathaden. Sailing date is 10th of August 1962. That's the original piano and Orient lines. Voyage is from Bombay to the UK. Four daughters, a son and an infant. I was, Mary was 15, yeah. Yeah. I was 14, I was 12, and I closed my 10th birthday when I came here. Ages of the sons, six and two third years, and infant 11 months. Our first cruise. <laughs> yeah. When we got to the docks, we'd never seen a ship as big I as that. We'd seen little boats in our lifetime, but never a ship. Oh, yeah. I remember I saying, you know, Mummy, where, where's the ship? Where's the ship? And she said, in front of you. I and I remember looking, looking right, right up. up. We all shared a cabin because, I mean, money wasn't there, so we had the cheapest cabin going. And of course, mm. Mary and myself, we were very, very proud. <laughs> we used to go <laughs> down, you know, a bit like the Titanic. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad it wasn't. <laughs> huge staircase and go to Second dinner, City, lunch, really? breakfast, lunch, dinner. And what did we order? Curry and rice. rice. <laughs> we arrived in this country on the 29th of August 1962. We came all hopefully wrapped up for the snow. That's what we as children were expecting to see. England covered in snow because these were our visions of England. Cobble streets and what have you. Mm. But when we arrived, it was quite a hot day. We came into Tilbury Docks. When you look back at it, it was a very gloomy, yeah, gloomy. Yes, sort of dark. Everything seemed dark because you left really bright sunshine. Very strange looking as opposed to India, you know, with the hustle and bustle. The days were cloudy. Sometimes you never saw the sun. Totally mm. dismal, totally miserable, because we had a lot of fog in those years. But to children, you don't think you just ever drift ever along ever. and just accept things for what they are. I'm talking from personal experience, going to with Dad to look for accommodation, and it would say plainly say no coloureds, no children, and if you did knock on the door, they would tell you to your face, no coloureds, no dogs, no pets, no children. So, you know, you had your choice. <laughs> when people first started to migrate into the country, they weren't accepted. But now you look now, 50 years later, it's completely different. That's where Alfie got chased by a lot of skinheads. He got into trouble. There's no country without racism. I don't believe it. Whether it be racism in colour-wise or in cultures or whatever the case, there is racism goes on. Well, I went to a pub in, in Mitcham. I was doing a mini cabin at that time and I went in there to get changed and everybody just looked at me and I went to the bar, he said, you know where you are, this is Bahman from me, you're not meant to be in this pub. And, you know the bull, bull, the bull. And uh, I had to leave, I felt, you, you can feel the hostility there. Yeah. My father did struggle to get us a footing. Yeah. And we were not a small family, you know, so Six he did struggle. But having said that, we had a lot of help from the Catholic Housing Aid Society. Yes. Very good. The house came through the Catholic Housing Aid Society. It was really connected to the church. And there was a Mr. Wade who mentioned it to Mr. McEvan that there's a chap called Mr. Fleury, just come from India too. Mr. McEvan of that family was in the army with Dad. It's certain same outfit in the Middle East after the war they worked in the railways and when he heard my dad needed accommodation they gave up some of their rooms to give us two rooms to stay in. Very very difficult to get accommodation especially for a family of six, uh, well eight as we were because six children and parents. They were a family of 11 children, 13, two parents. Well like sardines in a tin because that's how it was in those days people coming into the country. We lived in the top flat, very top and then the McEvans lived in the first floor, the second floor, and then the Nicholas family lived on the first floor, and the nuns lived in the basement. And how many bathrooms? One. 
there were 30 people in that house. There were four families, eight adults and the rest were children. All Anglo Indians. The winter of 1962 papers would confirm that it was one of the coldest winters we came into. No sense of eating, so we had to buy paraffin and physically bring it back to light the paraffin fires. I remember my mom cooking on the landing. There was a little like a kitchenette set up for her, but it was a sink and a cooker, maybe. Really. Yes, and she used to stand there and cook in her overcoat and in her snow boots, as we used to call them because it was that cold, you know, the was only on the outside, but we had them on the inside as well, because we were very hot. <laughs> on arrival, Mum absolutely hated being in, uh, because she said to my dad once, and I remember those words, John, what have you brought us to? It certainly would have been very difficult for my mum because she was leaving all her sisters and her brothers behind. The hope of ever returning to India was absolutely nil. Nobody travelled on foreign holidays as they do now. The moment I came to India, I was only 14, I cried to go back because I was enjoying my childhood in India. I tried to fly the kite the same way as India in, in, in Addington, as Ken and myself. And uh, all the aeroplanes came fly, flying over us and made us take it down. Yeah. Mind you, we tried to fly it very high, which we tried, like, like in India. But uh, you're not allowed to do that, yeah? I didn't know anyone. It was very, very... Uh, I felt very isolated. And being an impressionable age of just 15, you know, I did feel a little sad, if you like. I'd left my friends and school friends and things like that. So it was, it was it, for me, it was a drastic change. Whereas my brothers and sisters, they were put into school and they quickly made friends. At the age of 15, I was quite naive about a lot of things because of our upbringing basically in India. My first job was a job called, um, uh, in a company called Holloway Engineering Works. I had a three pound salary in, in Holloway Engineering Works. That was my starting salary. Three pounds. You can get was. a job as a soldier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's quite I mean, sad when you think back to it because yeah. she was only a child. Everyone at that time did, did that to, to support the family children, yeah. because yeah. there was no money. I worked with this Irish lady and we started talking about food one day and she started talking about her budgies. And I said, Oh, do you know what they are? And she said, Of course. She says, um, And I said, Oh, because my mum cooks them on a Sunday. <laughs> she said, you don't eat them, do you? So I said, oh, yes. I said, my mum makes them for, for tea on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, she was talking about the birds, and I was talking about a dish which is dipped in batter with uh, aubergines or potato, and, and it's, it's, it's deep fried. And I think she was none the wiser, and she was horrified at the thought that I ate budgies. Just a little story about Mary that she told us. Work colleagues would have asked them uh, if she was a virgin. And she said, certainly not, you know, I'm not a virgin. Because their association with the word virgin was the Virgin Mary, you know, and Catholics. So uh, they were shocked for someone to be calling them a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, oh no, definitely no, we're not a virgin. <laughs> and they were quite shocked. <laughs> I mean, we grew up in London in the 60s. One good thing about Britain having the empire the sun never set on is that you've got so many cultures. Anything you want from the planet is available in London. We went to a dance and there was a West Indian dance. Beauty, we went to beauty pageant. Yeah. I did come first at that and Anne came second. <laughs> beauty competition we both went in for. <laughs> it wasn't very good for the West Indians when these two Indian girls won. <laughs> Bikini and the black boots, wasn't it? Yes. And I'm very shy, as you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's not a photograph. All right. oh, okay. <laughs> London was an experience. 
We used to go out together. Smoking can damage your health. <laughs> Oh, right. We were finding our way around London. <laughs> Anchor breakers. <laughs> Just what I need. It was exciting. All the Anglo Indians that came at that time were trying to you know, establish and find their feet, and we were glad to meet people from our country where we had common ground. It was nice to know that you know we had the same background and we could talk about the same things and uh, you know just have fun. <laughs> <laughs> in those days, we were seeking out Anglo Indians. We had not long been in the country. We came in '62, so uh, like a lot of Anglo Indians, and um, we were eager to meet up with other Anglo Indians. It was a community we came from, so it's a community you associated with, like everyone who comes any sort of ethnic minority. We did used to go to the Star, and yeah. I, I was about yeah. 15 yeah. or 16. Yeah, but I that was through the back. No, no, that through was the back through the back. back. It was known as the Star in our day. It was a continental club, and eventually us Anglo-Indians, we just took over, <laughs> and we made it our club. So we spent a lot of little happy days there, didn't we? <laughs> when we arrived on the continental club. <laughs> We used to just go to dance and listen to music, that's all, and meet fellow Anglo Indians. And that's how we we sort of re-gelled with our community, if you like. You'll always get the Anglo Indian community meeting each other in the dance. Yes, we've got a memory lane. They talk to each other, what they should do in India and things like that. And they all had the same thing in common. If all the angles have the same thing in common, so they can relate to it. It's, uh, it was nice. I met Gary at an Anglo Indian dance, funny enough, and he did, contrary to what he may say, he did come running after me to get my phone number. Oh, did he? Yeah, and I keep him running. <laughs> he, he was desperate to get into the Fleury family. Absolutely, <laughs> we tell him that, yes. The best thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> Five children, three grandchildren later. Yeah, it's been a good marriage. She was a tart. She, she met him. <laughs> I'll tell you all about that one. We went on our first holiday to Plymouth. Now, we all got down there. We were so tired. We just could not go out. But as my father always used to say, you hit two dustbin lins together and Liz will get up and dance. <laughs> Poor old Frank. He was out for a few drinks. Did he know a trap had been set? <laughs> no, he didn't. Yes. <laughs> the tender trap. <laughs> I was in my cat suit and he was on his way out and he saw that figure hugging cat suit. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no going back. <laughs> my wife, well, unfortunately, I married one of the Flurry clan. <laughs> <laughs> Dudley was initially a friend of Liz's, isn't it? That's how yeah. I met Dudley. So I met Liz, Liz in a dance somewhere. And uh, she tried to get hold of me, but she couldn't. I mean, Dudley, <laughs> I think Dudley probably thought we were attracted to him somehow. <laughs> when you're young, you want to think that, don't you? She was the best sister of the Lord. They all tried, they all tried to get me, all the sisters. But uh, uh, Anne was lucky enough to have get me. <laughs> And Dudley came to the house one day and he saw a picture of Anne. Mm, and that was think, it. That was it. He thought, that's the girl for me. Mm. And of course, I eventually Lucky introduced Anne. them. <laughs> but thankfully, I passed him on. <laughs> Once you get to know a flurry girl, well, you it's know. It's very hard to give up. <laughs> <laughs> Five easy lessons. She worked for me. We, uh, I was married at the time. Huh? I was married at the time. You were she was my secretary.
You got this on camera? Yeah. So I've now adopted all 150 to 170 Anglo Indians. <laughs> so all we knew was religion and Sex, drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> I liked music. We all liked music. Guitars used to come out, and there was always a sing song. Or, or, you know, in the, in the gathering with, um, in full swing, and the sisters always in fine voice. Anglo Indian ladies would come out in their what was in the 60s, their big frilly dresses with the can can skirts underneath, and the rock and roll shoes, and the men would dress up in their suits. Even the aunties picking us up from school, the lipstick the used lipstick. to go on, <laughs> the eyebrows used to go on. <laughs> you remember that? How can I not remember that on Cloudy Tales out here? Yeah, you <laughs> remember Jackson, that was a lot of stuff in the country. I used to get all the guns. Oh, and I'm Kalafi Gordon with Elvis, like most Anglo Indians. DJ for the night has got music to suit all ages. She's got music for the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And if you're fed up with that, you move into the 1900s. The <laughs> one more thing Elvis tonight is in the building. <laughs> okay, ladies and gents, please give Gary a nice big round of applause. Hello, Gary. Oh, you're lucky the jiving. Oh, yeah. That's, 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 that's very Anglo Indian. The Anglo Indians, they love a good jive. Yeah. Yes. They try to teach us. <laughs> but we haven't to try. <laughs> I love a party, I'm a party girl. And my dad, when he came over to this country, he was stop at driving. In fact, his nickname was Pat. Anglo Indians love music. They love music and they love dancing. They love to party. They're all party animals, all of them. You can't be an Anglo Indian without jiving. We grew up with jiving. And as, as soon as we could, our parents taught us, our dad taught us how to jive. Music has always been part of our lives. We just left Stromberg. And uh, we would sit out in India in the moonlight. The guitars would come out and we'd have a little sing-song. Mostly country and western songs are very, very old. love our music and till today we still love our music. I love it when like everybody gets around and like, <laughs> like somebody has a guitar and everybody's singing. They're pretty gifted on, on the music front I think. Even in India although we were Anglian, my father was very much integrated with the Indian people. He loved yeah. the Indian people as much as well he just loved people. My parents when we were in the 60s and we had parties everyone came to our house. We had Raj and all that would come, they were from Pakistan. We never uh, differentiated between black and white. We had a, a, a great big merry mix of people that would come. We didn't recognize someone <laughs> by color. Because yeah. being Anglo Indian, you came from a multicolored family anyway, yeah, you know. So. Yeah. Uh, we had all sorts of shades. Whoever came to our home was always welcome. And that was my mum and dad's uh, noted for their hospitality. 
And so we, right, we then, never... Right, insurance men used to always come and sit and have a good drink with Brenda. He'd be there for hours. He'd only come to pick up the insurance mm. money, but he'll be there for ages. <laughs> so that's what Anglo-Indians are. They're very congenial. They're very nice. They like everybody. And simply, I just love them all. I couldn't wish for a better family. Like God dare say what would have happened in India yeah. because mm. In India, boys are always put first and girls always, it's a struggle. We were four girls born first, so we would never have stood a chance because, you know, mum and dad couldn't afford a lot, so our education would have been limited because you had to pay for your education there. So to get jobs, it would have been very difficult. Definitely, we wouldn't have had the opportunities that we've had here. It's the best thing our parents ever did for us. You thank. God for bringing us here and for mum and dad. Oh, England. Yeah, sacrificing the love and uh, mm -hmm. giving us a start in life. And now our children as well. We've now got a family of probably about 70 ish sort of members. We're so used to the family getting together and uh, as you know, it's not on a, a small scale, it's always a big scale. A lot of people don't know what Anglo-Indian is. If they're happy with Asian, I say Asian. If not, then you have to do the whole explanation of what it is. I suppose I'm more English than what, what they are, because they've, they've got part of their roots still back in, in India as well. They, know, they, they knew that side of life, whereas I didn't. The Anglo-Indians will still remain forever, I think. It'll just be that they lose that identity of being calling themselves Anglo-Indian. They'll, they'll adopt the homeland wherever they are. I don't particularly feel, um, I can't associate myself with any one group. Um, we're very much, yeah. um, I don't know, I can't even explain it really. Because we have so many influences from the Asian side, from the European side, from just living in London and the cultural mixture over there. Um, it's it's difficult to <laughs> difficult to um, box yourself off in in any direction. You know, it's uh, very it's much an individual, aren't you? Yeah, and um, a lot of people when they see us, they can't pinpoint us, and they'll say, "So sort of, where are you from? Are you sort of?" Sometimes I think you're South American, or like, yeah, they don't know if you're Indian you know, or like going European. To... The little kids asked me if I was Red Indian. <laughs> Kind of pass for anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's even more mixed. So, um, so my mum is Liz Fleury, who's Anglo Indian, but my dad is uh, Frank Sloan, who's um, Scottish. So, um, myself and Chris are even more Anglo Indian, I suppose you call us. Yeah, I don't know really what you would. I didn't know what to say when I was little. So shown how diverse uh, anglo anglo society has got, so I've had a few drinks as well. We've all gone with different partners from different races, the Anglo-Indian race is getting watered down. How many nationalities are in our extended family? Oh, I haven't, I've lost count. Nationalities? In May? Yeah, now we're talking right, uh, there's like... Whoa. French, English, Spanish. We go across the globe in the, with the Anglo Indian part, you know? We, we go through it. It's kind of like a star sort of shape. New Zealand, Scottish, Jamaican, Indian, Canadian, Russian, Irish, American. <laughs> wow. Loads of nationalities. So we, we've got everything, all, we're all yeah. putting everything into the family, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> I'm glad I'm in my adopted country and I love England with all my heart. <laughs> I'd like to be known as a Londoner. <laughs> Having spent 15 years here, London accept me. <laughs> I'm British. <laughs> when we went to India and I saw where my mum and Auntie Mary and all had come from in Eero made me see 
how well they built themselves up in this country and it made me appreciate what they've given to me. I hope they don't forget their roots. I don't actually think they would because look here tonight, you've got a lot of generations within the family have come together whereas uh, a lot of other families you don't get it at all. A lot of kids my age, they feel they're too cool to hang out with family. Where like you look at the older ones like Matthew, Christopher, me, Daniel, Thomas. We we love it. We love being with each other. Like like know, it's just great. So the rest of my aunties, uncles, thank you for bringing us up like the way we have. Like you've taught us a lot, and we appreciate every moment of it. And um, yeah, I'm glad to be who I am and the family that I've grown up in. The culture is fast disappearing, which is such a pity. I'm very proud to be Anglian, Indian, and sadly, I think we will be the last generation because the generation born in this country, they don't relate as we do. They like the family way of life because we do, I think, cultivate a good family way of life. And they, you know, we keep cousins and things, hopefully keep the ties yeah. bound. But uh, after our generation, sadly, like the dancers and things, will die out. There won't be that community left. The next generation, the Anglo-Indian, I think, is dying out. It's, it's a dying race now. Because the Anglo-Indian now, from gen when it goes to the next generation, they'll know of Anglo-Indian, but they'll, it'll soon, the water is watering down. You cannot expect them to be the same as us. And, uh, they, they, or they, or they know this way of life and uh, they don't know how we, the way of life. It's gone now. We're the last of the Mohicans, and that's it. <laughs> the immigrants have now reached our retirement age because I am now 65 last week. And, uh, you know, there's the few years left of our retirement and hopefully we will be blessed with good health we, and a fairly decent dab of happiness, if you like. And I hope we leave this lovely um, story of our family and our community and all the memories that go with it for the ones that we are now, uh, our children in this country, grandchildren and further on, who knows. And I hope they will enjoy uh, someday sitting and looking at it and saying, oh look, you know, we actually came from that family. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> this is... Hello, I'm Auntie Liz. I'm going to show you how to make curry puffs, or patties as some people call them. All you need is a few fresh ingredients. We start by frying some chopped onions to a golden brown. Now you add the fresh garlic. I use about six cloves of garlic, unless you're hoping to kiss someone. <laughs> I'd rather have a good steak pie. <laughs> Then add chopped ginger. Cook these for a few minutes, making sure that the garlic doesn't burn. Once the ginger and garlic have cooked, you add the ground spices. Coriander, turmeric, cumin, and finally, chili powder. Depends how hot you like it. I put about two teaspoonfuls in. Then add chopped in tomatoes. Mix that all together. They form a bit of a paste. Cover it and cook it for a minute or so. Then you add the minced lamb, mutton, or beef. Give that all a good stir to blend the spices with the meat. Add a little bit of salt. You can always check the seasoning again later. We cover that and let it cook for a while. Now that the meat is cooled, we can continue with the next stage of the curry puff making. Roll out the pastry to the thickness of a 2p piece. Cut the pastry to the size you require. I use a circular pastry. You can have squares if you wish or whatever size. I like them small and dainty, just like me. <laughs> Fill each little square with a teaspoon or so of the mixture. <laughs> Dampen the edges. 
fold it over, press it down and with a fork you just prick the sides. Top, you make a few holes to allow the steam to escape. Then you brush with beaten egg and cook in a hot oven about 200 degrees centigrade till it's golden brown. My famous curry puffs. <laughs>